Hi, my name's John Olszewski from Enumclaw, Washington, the great state of Washington, north of Oregon, where we are today. Today I'm going to tie the Crossfields black silk. For many of you that are salmon fly tires, you're familiar with this pattern as, as a reduced full dress fly. Uh, quite a historical fly. Ernest Crossfield <coughs> was the first Brit to really reduce some of the standard full dress patterns. And his flies went down in history as, as a minimalist pattern that gave you a lot of action and color. Uh, many of us that steelhead today are quite enamored with these flies as well as the techniques involved. At this point, I'm going to start tying the fly on a, on a blind eye hook. And since this hook has no eye, I'll be attaching an eye of twisted silkworm gut. Twisted silkworm gut was, was used for the eyes of flies before the technology was, was evolved far enough to make a, a quality return loop eye on a hook. Silkworm gut itself was used before before monofilament was invented. So anybody that has tied these flies is, is familiar with the product. So I've started my thread about a quarter of an inch behind the end of the hook. And at this point, I'm going to take my, my gut loop and attach it lightly with two threads back towards the front of the fly. Once I have this attached, I can go ahead and adjust it so that I get the size loop I want. Now this fly, the, the black silk by Ernest Crossfield is a silk bodied fly that has, it has no, uh, it's got no fur at all on the body. So in making a, a gut loop, connection, I want this gut to be as smooth as I can get it along the shank of the hook. And to do that, I've had this gut in my mouth for 15 minutes or so, just softening the ends of it. I've made my loop, I've attached it to the hook, and now what I'm doing is actually taking the twist out of the gut. The gut itself is three strands twisted. So when I make the loop and come back on the hook, I've got six strands of gut to deal with. These strands have to be hidden in a manner in which the body will, will continue to be smooth and, and taper from the front to the back. To do this, I've attached the gut where it was still twisted I've untwisted it all the way up to where the thread catches it. And at this point, I can start tapering the gut into the hook itself. So it's untwisted, and I'll wrap back onto the untwisted sections about three wraps. And here, I have six individual strands now from the twist facing to the back of the hook. And what I'm going to do is align them so they're all coming out parallel and even on the bottom of the hook shank. And I've got them separated now, so I've got the two on the one side, the two on the other side, and then the two out of the middle separated. And the two out of the middle will be the first ones I remove. With an X-Acto knife, very, very carefully, I'll come in and taper these back to the back. And by tapering like this, I have no steep junctions on the hook shank. So I've tapered the two out of the middle, and now I'll wrap back and cover those. 
when I get to that point, now I'm down to four strands. I'll take the two out of the middle and take them off, again, tapering as much as I can and not taking them off at the same length. We're trying to build gradual taper and a smooth transition to the hook shank. So with those two pieces removed, I'll wind back beyond where they were cut and get just to a point where now I've only got two strands of gut. Where I started with six, I've got two. Now it's important with these last two to be very delicate with the cutting. It's, it's got to be done at a real shallow angle and they can't be the same length. So I'll take the first one and really trim it down, wrap back almost to the point where I've cut it off, and then I'll come in again and taper out the last one. At this point, I've got the gut attached it goes well past the, the halfway point of the, the hook shank and it tapers into a smooth, neat transition into the hook. You'll notice I'm twisting the, uh, the thread, the bobbin, and the reason for that is I want to get as little thread onto the hook as I can and each wrap of thread being flat will go farther and cause less bulk. So you see my hand going back and forth and I'm actually painting the thread onto the hook shank. Many of these procedures seem like they're overkill, like they're unnecessary, but we're really building a house of cards that we want to build to last. And each step affects the next one and if something is not done right, eventually it'll catch up to you and cause a problem. And if not, as the tire, you know it's not right. So it's worth doing it right and being happy with what you do. OK, I'll use my bobbin as a, a plumb bob. And you can see that my thread is almost back to the point of the hook. Now where I want my tag and tip to start is at the point of the hook. So I'll come back a little bit more and see how we look. Now right there is where I want to tie in my first material. This fly, as, as most salmon flies, has a tip and tag, the tip being silver tinsel fine oval silver tinsel and the tag itself being golden yellow floss. When I attach my tinsel, I like to attach it on the far side of the hook on the bottom. My tinsel's attached, and I'll go ahead and run my thread all the way back to where I'm going to start with the the few ten, the few turns of this oval tinsel that will be the tip of the tag. Again, with flat, smooth wraps of thread side by side. And when I get back to this point where I'm going to start. I want to make one wrap of thread as thin as I can on the hook shank just so I have a hint of taper in the thread. Now I'll come back forward with several wraps of thread side by side beyond the point where the tinsel will end and then I'll get rid of my thread forward. Now the oval tinsel can be wrapped on a hook shank two ways. You can, you can 
pull it towards you and just wrap it, which will cause a fold and a bump. Or you can have your tinsel coming straight from underneath the hook, pull it up, and then you're just turning the tinsel rather than folding it. I pulled that tinsel out, turned it, and made the first wrap on bare hook shank. Now the second wrap will be on a single layer of thread, and the third wrap will be on two layers of thread. Now I've made three wraps of tinsel, and I'll tie it off at this point. And when I tie it off, I want to get it as close to the other piece and as parallel as I can. So with my thumbnail, I'll hold it and straighten it out. Now I've got <clears throat> now I've got three wraps of tinsel over that thread, and I'm going to come forward and hide the butt end of this tinsel with smooth side by side wraps of tinsel. I'll come up to the point where I started the tag. When I get to the point where I want my tag to start, right there, I'm going to cut the tinsel off and have a little nub in there, make one more wrap over it. And at that point, I can cut off the end where the tinsel was started. So now I have my tag complete and I have I have my tip parameters set, and I'll go ahead and add my silk floss. Now this floss is very, well, it's, it's real, it's genuine silk, which means that if you have any oils at all on your hands or burrs, you will pretty much destroy it. It will not be a smooth, bright floss. So I'm going to handle it gently. I've tied it in with one turn of thread. At this point, I'll take my thread ahead again and get it out of my way. And gently, I'll start the floss, trying to get it as flat and smooth as I can at the front of the tag and head to the back. With smooth side-by-side -side wraps, I'll continue all the way back against the tip and turn around and come back forward. Now at this point, I'm at what I refer to as the turnaround, the last wrap against the tensile. And it's very important to get that one just right so that there's no gaps, and then turn it and come forward. Side by side, nice smooth wraps. To that point. Now I can unwrap my thread all the way to where it was tied in and unwrap two or three further turns. At this point, I've unwrapped turns of thread that are underneath the silk, and the silk is, turned, is tied in by itself. At this point, there's no thread holding the silk. I'll make one wrap underneath to catch the butt ends, and at that point, the tag is done. I have two options here. I can work the floss in underneath the body, or I can cut it off. And in this instance, with this fly being so slim and light in the rear, I'm going to cut it off. And that will be an unnoticeable piece of bulk. 
for the tail on this fly, we're going to use golden pheasant crest. It's very important to pick a crest that's appropriate to the fly, both in size and depth of fiber. And rather than pick a short crest that's the right length for the fly right off the bird, I'm going to pick one that's a little long because I want to, I want to look at the fiber count at the tip. What I'm concerned with is, is the depth of fiber in the tip area. So at this point, I'll judge the, the length that I want, which is a personal thing, and determine where that will be tied in and remove all the extra fibers. That's what I want, a little bit of bulk in the tail, but not a real high arcing crest as in a lot of the classic salmon flies. It's helpful to have pliers and smash the quill at this point where you're going to tie it in. Many people re prefer to use their teeth, but I honestly don't know where this bird's been, so I'll use my pliers. and tie in the topping, rather the crest, with two turns of thread. And then I can adjust it to the shape and length I want. After I've got this tied in, I'll leave the stump of that crest and I'll take that off later after I tie in the next material, which is a golden pheasant tippet. This pattern calls for tippet in strands, but rather than using strands, I'm going to use a tippet and I'm going to strip it down and then cut the middle out of it. so that I have just a few fibers on either side of this quill, like this. At this point, this can be laid on top of the tail with a soft loop, come up around, trap the fibers, and secure them to the hook. And now this can be pulled and these tippet strands can be pulled right into place. And I like the looks of that, so at this point I'll take off these tippet fibers at a rather exaggerated angle, again, to smooth out the lumps and bumps. And as well, I'll take out the tail bud at this point. All right, the next item in this fly is the the ribbing tensile, which again will be an oval silver. And I'm going to tie it in exactly where I'm at. Many of you will look and think that that's not at the rear of the body, but we'll come back to that and take care of it later. So the tensile is tied in at this point and we'll just make even, smooth wraps of thread right back up towards the head. 
Now with this tensile, I have an option when I get to where the gut was tied to the hook itself. If I don't like the smoothness of that taper, in this case I don't, I can take care of a lot of that with this tensile at this point. And here, we'll unwind this tensile and get down to just the core. And then come forward and bury it. So now I've gotten to the point where the gut terminated and I'll just cut that off at an angle, smooth that out underneath and continue forward, giving the fly a nice smooth transition and keep going right to the front. Now the pattern the black silk calls for a black silk body, hence the name, as well as a claret hackle. In this case, the black silk will be started at the front of the fly, will go to the back of the fly and then come back forward to the front. So my next material to tie in would be the black silk. But rather than start with that, I'm going to fold my hackle so that when I get to that point, I've got it folded and ready to tie in with the silk. The hackle will be hot tied in midway in the body, but it will be tied in with the silk itself. Folding hackle is a delicate process for many people, but time will prevail and you'll soon get your own technique and your own feel. I take the good side of the feather, face it away from me, and fold the top fibers down over the bottom fibers. And in doing this, I have not disturbed the fibers on one side of the quill, but on the other side of the quill, they've been disturbed considerably. Okay, so that hackle is folded, and when it is wrapped up the body, the side that I have not disturbed will be the outside. The side that I have folded will be the under fibers, and that'll give me a nice, smooth hackle with all the fibers pointing the direction I want. At this point, I'll tie in my black silk. and complete the body. The silk has to be handled gently, particularly with the condition of my hands, because it will turn into a frayed up mess. So I'm going to handle it as gently as I can and as little as I can. Tying the tinsel in, or the floss in, excuse me, I'll start working to the back of the fly. Now from the camera angle, you may see just a hint of white between some of these wraps. And that's simply because I'm, 
I'm building bulk and trying to cover the hook, but the floss is quite thin and I'm confident I can cover and, and smooth the floss as I come forward. So on my last trip forward with the floss, I'm confident I'll be able to smooth this out if we keep the floss in good condition. Now again, I'm to the turnaround, just as I was at the tag. This is a very important place to take the time and be accurate with your placement. I want this floss to be right up against the tag and then come back forward. This fly is going to have five wraps of tinsel, and I want my hackle turned in, tied in so that the so that it follows from from the fourth wrap of tinsel, and that's where I'm at right now. So at this point, I'm going to tie in my body hackle underneath the hook, slightly to the the back side and I'm going to tie it in with the floss. Coming forward in nice smooth flat wraps We'll come all the way up to the front of the fly and just bury this hackle point. Now at this point I can cut the hackle off at the point or I can continue wrapping depending on the condition of the body and I'm going to decide to cut it off at this point. And after cutting it off Simply continue up with smooth side-by-side -side wraps. It's not unheard of for a, a salmon fly tire doing fine silk work to use silk gloves when handling this floss and to do your very best work, that's certainly what I would do. Silk gloves being slippery, clean, and keeping the floss from absorbing any oils. Now I'm up to the front of the fly 
where I tied in the floss. And if I can get this unhooked, I'll tie it off here. Many, many variables in tying salmon flies. And this is a very good example. Had I paid attention, I never would have had this problem. So, we've got the floss almost to the point where we want to tie it off. And at that point, I'll reverse some wraps on the thread so that the floss has got itself tied in. There's no thread holding it now. And then come up behind it and capture it. With two wraps. And at this point, I'm ready to rib the fly with the pencil. Again, the tinsel, rather than being folded, will be pulled out parallel to the body and turned and started. The first wrap, and then the second wrap capturing the hackle. Second wrap right in front of where that hackle is tied in, and then continue to the front of the fly. When I've wrapped it to the front of the fly, I'll take one turn of thread to tie it off. <clears throat> the temptation at this point is to cut this tinsel off right next to the thread, but I'm not going to do that because I've only got one wrap of thread holding the tinsel. And after I wrap the body hackle, I can get rid of this. So. Now I'll walk the body hackle right up behind the ribbing tinsel, just as close as I can get it, right up to the front of the fly. When I've gotten this hackle to the point where I'm happy with where I've stopped it, I'll tie it in with one turn of thread, place it on the side of the hook, and come forward one more turn. And at this point, I can groom this body hackle, squeeze it, and get these fibers all pointing the way I want them. Having done that, now I can safely 
dispose of the waste ends of the tinsel as well as the hackle. And after exposing those butt ends with the cut, I'll make one more wrap just for security. And at this point, I can start with the underwing of the fly. Now the, the black silk is a rather untraditional fly in that it has tippet and strands, which is a traditional material for, a, for an underwing. But it also calls for golden pheasant points or body feathers, neither of which are appropriate in size for this fly. So I will use dyed hackle just to get my hint of red. Again, I've done the, the strands just like I did the tail. I'm going to set these over the hook so they're laying tent-like right over the front of the fly. Make a wrap of thread against where the hackle stopped and then just draw them up into place. And that way my tippet and strands are all the same length. And not bothersome. Now Ernest Crossfield's flies were designed under the theory that less is more. So they're quite sparse while still giving the illusion of a lot of material, a lot of movement. And again, this is all the underwing, so it will be covered in the front by other materials. Now instead of using the golden pheasant points, I'll use dyed neck hackle. And that way I can get the color and the texture without all the bulk. Picking out two reasonably close matched feathers. I can set them side by side over the, the tippet strands and get the color in bulk. You may notice that I'm not stripping off a lot of material off these neck hackles. Reason being it's just not necessary and I want the color. So tying them in with one or two wraps of thread, I'll draw them up into place where I want them. I think that's going to work just fine. Now when I reach in here, I've cut the, the hackle quill. So rather than pull all those extra fibers through, I'm going to pinch the wing and then pull them through and get less disruption.
at this point, we have one more material for our underwing, which is rather untraditional, and that would be a crest of the golden pheasant. And I'll pick a crest that's straight and doesn't have a lot of curve. because it's going to be covered in the front as we continue anyway. The crest can be prepared with all the standard methods of biting and twisting and squishing. And I think I like the looks of that. Now I'm going to put a throat on this, and what I'm using is a dyed guinea hen. The pattern itself called for blue jay, which I don't prefer to use, and is especially not appropriate on a fly this size. Again, this feather will be doubled just as the body hackle was. folding right over the quill. And there's a folded hackle. And what I'll do is I'll tie this in on the far side, not on the bottom, but not on the top. just the far side, come forward with my wraps of thread, and they'll be removed later. And now I can wrap this throat right up behind these butts of this underwing, and that will establish where my head will start. and that will be just fine. I'll back off the thread to the point where I have one or two turns holding this hackle in place and then tie it off on the near side.
I'm doing is pinching the hackle just to get it to lay the way I want it. And then when I'm done, I might remove a few of the fibers from the very top. Just to aid in setting the wing. Okay, at this point I've established where my head's going to start and I can attach my black thread that I will use in place of my working thread. I'll attach that right where the throat hackle stopped. Just making a few wraps directly over the thread, trapping the thread. And the fly will be completed with that black thread. And now I can take these wraps off till the point where it's trapped. <clears throat> now the next item will be the wing or rather the overwing. And for that, the pattern calls for golden pheasant tail as well as Amherst pheasant tail. The golden being the majority of the wing. On a fly this size, I like to use approximately six fibers of the golden and then two or three of the Amherst underneath. While it's not important how many fibers you use, that's an aesthetic call, it is important that you use the same amount on both sides. So it's always worthwhile to count when you're using a matched pair of tail feathers and you're cutting from the same place on the quill, you know that by using the same amount of fibers, you have the same amount of bulk. Now I have right and a left fiber from the golden pheasant tail. And I'll take a right and a left from the Amherst and these will be married together to form the outer wing. And you may notice that I've I've cut a little bit extra Amherst simply because it's easier to work with if I have a little bit extra and then when I have it married I can remove what I don't want and the wing has been much more cooperative. Again I'll do the same thing for the opposite side of the fly
and again I'll remove what I don't need so that I have two matching slips right and left. Now these fibers are going to be placed over the top of the overwing, or underwing, excuse me, and tinted gently right over the top while not covering the complete underwing. I'll adjust my length by eye. And once I've got that adjusted and I grasp it in my left hand, I've, I've, I've at this point assumed that I've got the right length and I'll make a soft loop up through my fingers with the thread, down around the wing, bringing the thread back up and gently pull in an upward motion while I continue to hold the wing butts in place. And at this point, I can let go and see just how we did. And I don't like it, we'll go ahead and back it off and try it again. And that will certainly work. Now once I remove these wing butts, I only have one more material to add to this fly. That material being bronze mallard. And that material will cover a lot of this fly in the front. Now the bronze mallard is similar to any other feather that you have to use right and left. In this case, I've got feathers that I've been using. And what I'll do is separate the amount I want from the quill and then gently stroking it to a right angle from the quill. Just like that, I'll grasp it at the bottom and tear it off the quill, leaving a little bit of the quill to aid in keeping it together. And again, I'll do the same thing from the opposing feather. Stroke it out 90 degrees. and then gently tear it off. Now, I'll take my thread back to the back of the head space, and that's where the mallard will be tied in. The two pieces will be put side to side 
and be laid right on the top of the fly in this manner. I certainly do want to tie in at the bottom of the feather where it's more gray in color and much stronger in fiber. So once I've laid them up in place over the top of the wing, it's just a simple matter of getting them to set just right the first time. Lay them right up over the top of the wing, adjusting the length. And then bring them right down on top of the front of the hook, tent fashion. At this point, again, making a soft loop and attaching the mallard. And that's set on there real nice. And that is all the material that's put on this hook. Now this fly is obviously quite a reduced pattern in the sense of traditional salmon flies, but it's a pattern that's very applicable to the Northwest. It's a very good steelhead fly and can be tied in varying degrees of fineness. A lot of guys use different colored hair for an underwing. But the basic premise is you've got a lot of color and a lot of action on a small fly without a lot of material. So having cut off those butts, now I'll wrap the thread smooth and flat right up to the front of the head, leaving just a hint of the hook showing. And then come back and shape and add thread wherever I may need it. My preference for heads in salmon flies are number one, I want the fly to look like it could be fished. I want the gut to be big enough and sturdy enough that, that you would consider fishing the fly. And rather than having a minimalist head, I want the head to be a nice, clean, tapered, smooth head. So I'm not striving for tiny, tiny, almost non-existent heads. I just want my heads to be well shaped and in a good proportion to the fly. I'll whip finish. And that is the completed black silk. Hi, my name is John Simonson. I'm from Corvallis, Oregon. I'm a member of the Mid Willamette Fly Fishers. I'm going to show you how to tie Marie's holographic coronamid. And uh, I tie this in uh, different colors black, red, olive, root beer. So, uh, first step would be to take a, a hook, and I use a, a small crystal bead 
the head of the fly. So you'll probably need to pinch down your barb on your hook and put that onto the, the hook shank. And the size hooks that I tie this in are uh, TMCO 200R style and anywhere from a size 16 to a size 12. So after you've got the, the hook into your, your vise, I like to start the thread up near the eye of the hook. And what I'll do is I'll build up a, a nice thread base on the hook shank. And what this allows me to do is get a nice taper on my fly so that it's very small at the bend of the hook and it's a lot thicker up near the, the bead. And I tie this all the way down to the, the bend of the hook. <coughs> and this way, the butt end of the fly has a little bit of a, of a bend to it. Next step would be to take your silver wire, which you'll use for the ribbing, and tie that in. And I unwind the thread so that it makes a nice even body. You wrap your thread all the way to the bend of the hook. We use that for our ribbing. Next step I like to do is take the the tubing, and this comes in a number of different colors. It comes in red, black, burgundy, olive, and a number of other shades. And I like to use the medium sized tubing. And it's very stretchy, it's like a rubber band. Tie it in and then stretch it so that it's real thin and wrap to the end, end of where the silver ribbing was wrapped. I like to take one wrap on the underside of the tinsel, and that prevents the tinsel ribbing, the silver ribbing, from winding back off of the bend of the hook. Turn your fly upside down. The next step is to take holographic tinsel or regular silver tinsel, anything that's shiny. That's going to represent the bubble that's on the chronomid, and that's the, the gases that are in the, the shuck, and that's how the chronomid comes to the surface. And I tie that on the underside of the hook. Just see if I can get you a shot of that. After you've got that secured, take your red micro tubing or black or whatever color you're using. Stretch it. I use mostly red and I change the color of the thread that I use and that gives different uh, shades underneath. So I'll use a black thread and I'll use the red tubing and it'll give me a, a red and black mottled look on the coronamid body. Uh, seems to be very effective. 
When you get up to where you've got the holographic tinsel tied in, pull it back, and then start wrapping in front of it. You want to put each wrap right in front of the, the last one. Tie that off when you get to the bottom of the bead. Trim your excess. And then you'll take the holographic strip and you'll just pull that forward so that you can tie that off right in front of the, right behind the bead there, actually. And then you'll trim off the excess. Now you rib the, the fly body, nice even segments. And the rib is going to secure the holographic tinsel that you tie it in so that in case a, a fish cuts it, that it doesn't unravel or fall off. This tinsel on the underside was my wife's idea. She thought it would be a good way to mimic the bubble. I like to put a little bit of a wing case on the, the coronamid. So I take a little bit of turkey model turkey. And uh, I do is I take a slip and I fold it in half. This way, if a, a fish cuts the, the wing case, it's a little bit sturdier. Tie that in at the back of the bead. Coronamids have a little white tuft at the top uh, of the fly, so I use ostrich hurl to imitate that white little tuft that they have. Just take a little bit of ostrich hurl. Tie that in right behind the, the turkey. Trim off your excess. do is just take <clears throat> three or four wraps right behind that bead. Tie that off and then you'll just trim that excess. Next step is for the thorax area. Use peacock curl. I use two strands of peacock curl. I tie them in by the tip, right behind the, the white ostrich curl that I just wrapped. What I like to do is make the peacock curl a little stronger, so I wrap it around the thread. In this way, if a fish's teeth bites through one of the peacock curls, it won't unravel. I like to stroke it a little bit, get some of the fuzz out. Wrap a nice little thorax right behind the white ostrich curl. Tie that off. Cut off the excess. And you'll take your wing case, pull it back.
secure it. Cut off the excess there. Half hitch. Whip finish it. And there's Marie's chronomid. A little holographic on the inside. I'm not sure if you can see that, but in the sunlight, it looks great. It creates a little bit of a flash. And uh, it's very effective when you fish it underneath an indicator and uh, just slowly retrieve it in. Hi, my name is Britt Phillips. I'm from Arroyo Grande, California, and I'm going to tie a, a, a fly that I really consider one of my, my real good searching patterns. It's a crane fly. I call it a mosquito hawk, and it's something that you might see in your bathroom, in your, in your kitchen, flying around. It's a big gangly uh, looking fly, and some people call it a daddy long legs. Uh, uh, the, the fly, the pattern actually originated, to my knowledge, in, in the United Kingdom. They use it a lot on streams and rivers, and I found it very, very effective. I'm going to use a 2X long hook. I happen to use Camazan hooks in a size 12. It's just the size that I'm really comfortable with. It has a long shank. Um, and about, I'm going to start the thread a couple of eyes back from, from, the, uh, from the eye of the hook. I'm going to immediately tie in some tinsel for ribbing. Now, th this is holographic tinsel. It's a real, th as thin as you can possibly get it, like 1 69th of an inch or so. It's very, very small stuff. And I'm going to take it right to the bend of the hook. I'm going to let that hang there. I'm going to take the thread right back up to the, the tie-in point. It gives me a good thread base. So that's where I'm going to go from there. The next material I'm going to tie in is, is a material very similar to uni yarn. It comes in spools. I usually pull off about, about six inches of this, six, eight inches of this, and this is what I'm going to be using for the body of the fly. Just going to tie it in by the tip, a couple of wraps, and I'm going to hang my bobbin off to the side, and I'm going to just machine this guy straight to the back of the hook. And when I get to the rib, I'm going to take this, the, the rib, and I'm going to put one wrap of this, this yarn behind it. What this does is this captures the rib because I, in the past I've always had challenges um, with the rib falling off the back of my body. So the bigger, bulkier bodies, the, the more I've had trouble with it. So I, now I just capture the, the, uh, the rib with one wrap of whatever I'm using for my body. Tie that off, clip the excess, and next what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a Velcro teaser and I'm going to rip this this yarn. And it was yarn to begin with, and, and once you rip it, it really has a, a, a real buggy look, and it looks almost like dubbing. And I'm lazy, and this is a good lazy person's fly. Wrap the rib, secure it off. and trim the excess. I'm done with that now. 
Now, this is a um, uh, this is knotted hand ring neck pheasant tail fibers. And what I've done is in my spare time, basically when I'm watching TV, in between the exciting parts, I, you know, during the show I usually do the tying on this thing, and during the commercials, uh, uh, it, it, I really just like watching commercials. What I do is I take two fibers of the tail, uh, this tail, and I tie a knot in it with a Rainey's knotting tool. This is a hook latch tool. You may have these tools for uh, working with braided Dacron. And you make a loop and you put it through and you pull a tip through. It takes a bit of time and it's, it's the worst part of this fly. But to, to really get the effect of the fly, you need, to, you need to go there and do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of these legs. These are two fibers each. And you can see the knots near the end. And the way I'm going to place these, uh, these knots is just past the bend of the hook. Because this is really a daddy long legs. And I'm going to have the, uh, the legs angled down so that they're going to dangle underneath the water. Tie two of those on my side. And then grab two from the other side of the, of the feather. Just grab two of those guys. I'm going to tie those so that the knots are past the body on the far side and tie them in and manipulate them so that they are down underneath the shank of the hook. Because you want them dangling down like, like this fly when it lands in the water. The fish is going to see it and know that it's a helpless fly. Next material is my wing and hackle. These are India Cree necks. They're real cheap. They're like two dollars a uh, two dollars a neck. And I used to use uh, expensive mets and stuff like that until my English friends, where I got this pattern, they said, "Oh, what are you doing, Brit? You're using that expensive hackle, and you should be using this cheap stuff because you don't want the fly to ride up on its hackle points. You want it to float flush with the water." You want those legs hanging down. So I'm going to pull off basically three hackles, two of them for legs, I mean two of them for wings and one for a hackle. Lay the hackle one aside for the time being. I'm just going to match the tips on these guys right on top of each other. Match the tips. I'm going to measure it so that the, the length of the wing is going to be about the, to the, be, the back of the bend of the hook. I trim it, strip the, uh, the fibers off the, uh, the stem, grab both of them right on top of each other, and I'm just going to lay that right on top of the hook and hold it with my thumb. Take a few wraps. And then sometimes, if you're good, you can hit it with your, your, your thumbnail and it'll split them like that. That's almost exactly what I want to do. But I want them split even more. So I'm going to grab these guys and I'm going to put a couple of threads of, a uh, couple of wraps of thread behind that wing. When I got it about this, about like a B-52 bomber, I have those, the, the, the wings set there. So now you have the, your legs draggling off to the back, you got your wings. Next I'm going to put on this hackle. Cheap big hackle is, is uh, appropriately big, but bigger than, than what you'd normally do on this guy. This is a size 12, and this is probably hackle for maybe an 8 or something like that. Prepare the, prepare the feather, prepare the feather, tie it in, and then just leave it there. Next what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be putting on a little head. And this head is going to be some kind of dubbing. I'm going to use seal fur right here. I like seal. It has good sparkle. It's got good translucency. 
I really like this stuff. I'm just going to put it on. I'm not going to put it real tight onto this thread. One thing that's really hard to work with, or a lot of people think it's a lot hard to work with, but it's not really. I'm just going to take that whole noodle and I'm going to push it up to the hook. And I'm going to take one wrap over the top. And what that does is that anchors the top fibers in, the, in, in this bit of dubbing. And I go down to the bottom, and I'm going to start twisting that right on the thread. And it creates its own yarn, OK? So we got this yarn. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to start wrapping a head of seal. When I've got enough, Take the excess off, save that for later. Put a couple of half inches. This kind of vise, you can, you, can, you can flip the fly upside down and do your half inches so that the down eye is up so that the thread doesn't fall off. Makes it work pretty good. Hackle pliers. Grab the hackle. I like to tie it in by the butt. It's sort of wet fly style. I'm going to be sweeping these, these fibers back as I go forward. And only about three, maybe four wraps of, 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 uh, of hackle. Pull that back make a very small head, half inch right on the front. I'm going to trim my, my thread. And then I'm going to turn this fly. This is basically the done fly from the top view. You have your wings basically at B-52 bomber angle. And I'm going to go down here underneath, and I'm going to trim all of the hackle even with the body. So that this guy, when it lands, it's going to land and lay flush in the water. The legs are going to hopefully be down underneath the water, and it's going to look like, it's going to look like uh, something that's in, in really a lot of trouble. That's the, the view that I'm, I'm really looking for on this fly. It's been extremely successful. I tie this in, in ginger. Um, it, this is a camel color. I tie it gray, dark gray, black and red. It's a really good color for this with the appropriate colored wings that will complement uh, the body color. I like to use Cree an awful lot. That's my mosquito hawk. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Britt Phillips. I'm from Arroyo Grande, California. It's on, on the central coast of California, about halfway in between Los Angeles and San Francisco, near Pismo Beach. Most people know where Pismo Beach is. What I'm going to be tying uh, for you right now is a little crustacean that I came up with. Uh, it's a freshwater scud. Really is, has been a real confidence fly for me. And, and uh, what it is is it's a glass bead fly. Now I tie them in, in a variety of different colors uh, as far as the glass beads, as far as the dubbing. And what this little guy here actually is, is more of a handle than it is a tail. Sometimes I leave it on, sometimes I cut it off when I'm on the stream, but I, I, I like it. And, and sometimes I use that also as a shell back on, on this fly, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the hook. This is a straight shank uh, Camazan B160 hook. This is a real short shank hook. Uh, I chose this hook mainly because of the short shank and the wide gap. It uh, has a micro barb. 
and it's a it's just a, a, a real good hook in, in, my, in my view. And the other good thing is, is that almost any bead, I'm holding this with a little, uh, a little micro uh, dealy, it'll accept almost any bead without pinching down the barb. If you want to pinch down the barb, go right ahead, but you really don't need to. Let me hold it with this little electric uh, grab, mini grabber here. And uh, a way that I, I kept on being frustrated by uh, getting beads on hooks, and the glass beads mostly. What I do is I put them in a little little container like this, okay? Then I take the hook, one that's still hooked on to this, to this mini grabber, and I just dip it. Oh, whoa. Three beads, one shot, okay? So I got th my, my three beads, one little dip into, into the beads. Most of the time you don't get three. I was lucky there. Okay. Mount this in the in the vise. I got my beads behind the last bead towards the bend. I'm going to start my thread, and I'm going to just do a thread base pretty much around the bend. Some of the flies, I'll, I'll do a tag on them and other kinds of things. But the orange, I really like the orange on on, on this fly. The next material I'm going to tie on is. This is flexi floss, or, or it's, a, it's, it's actually uh, that, that uh, spandex stuff. You can get it in a variety of different kinds of, of um, dyed colors. This one happens to be from a bass skirt for bass fishing uh, people, and uh, it has two colors on it, which is uh, it's just doubly useful. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tie this thing in right here at the bend, and that's going to be my handle and my shell back. So the only thing I want to make sure is that this thing is really right on top of the hook. And it's going to get in the way, and it's going to just not, not be a, a happy camper, but we'll, we'll deal with that. So I have my tail and my shell back tied in right now. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get this, uh, this low-tech loon wax. This seems to be the, about the best stuff that I've seen for this particular operation. Okay. I'm going to take this, and you're going to, you're going to see this, this dubbing uh, technique a couple of times throughout the, the, the tying of this fly. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to wax the top three quarters of an inch or an inch or so of this thread. Just a little bit, not, not a whole lot. I don't want a whole bunch hanging off. I'm going to take some, so this is amber seal fur. I happen to like the seal. Uh, it dubs real good. And I'm just going to play with it a little bit, pulling it apart, because I want the fibers to be loose in this, in this little bit of dubbing here. Okay? I'll take the thread, and I'm going to spin this thread as I'm dusting the thread with the seal. What's going to happen is that just a little bit of dubbing is going to go onto that thread. It's a little bit too much. I'm not going to pinch it. I'm not going to do anything to it. Basically, I'm just going to push it up the, 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 the thread just a little bit, and then I'm going to wind this on the shank. Because what I want is I want this standing off at, at, in a bunch of different directions to act as legs. Immediately on doing that little bit of dubbing, I'm going to throw a half hitch in. I'm going to push the beads back just a little bit back onto that dubbing. Now just in front of that last bead, I'm going to start to thread with some half hitches right there. Now what this does is this is going to compartmentalize the beads. I'm doing this really slow. And then as I'm just tightening up that, that thread, I want to push the beads back onto that dubbing. Okay. So that, what that does is that protects the thread because I'm tying off before and after each bead. More wax. I call this spin dub. Because you're spinning the thread and you're just pushing the dub, dubbing on there. Rotate this, get the, get the um, the dubbing onto the, the hook, a couple of 
half inches. Again, just before I tighten up on that thread, I'm going to push those beads back. That pushes the knot back and it compartmentalizes that part of the fly. This, this bead is not going any place now because it's tied in before and after. Okay? Now I can start half inches in between the number two bead and the number one bead. Again, just before I, I tighten up, push it back. So all that dubbing, all that loose dubbing is down in between those beads. Next, more wax, more loose dubbing. And generally what I do with this fly, as I move up the fly, I'm going to use less and less dubbing. Push that up towards the hook, give it a spin, half inches, two or three half inches per segment is, is fine. And then push that, bead, that, that front bead back. Crank this over. Last bead, half hitch. Okay, push that bead back. Okay. Now this last little bit, I'm gonna change colors. And I'm gonna use a little bit of pink seal. Same stuff, same technique, no different. Just gonna play with it a little bit, just pull it apart. You can do this with the other dubbings too, the Angora Goat you can use, you can use Squirrel. Um, just depends on what you wanna use. Spin the thread, that's all you wanna do. Just spin the thread, push it up to the hook, and when you rotate this guy, just ties it right on automatically. It binds it down by, its, by the thread that's after it. Half inches. Now the shellback has always been a little bit of a hassle for me. and It doesn't really look all that great when I'm doing it. But you got to do it, so you might as well just go ahead and do it. Because you're doing it o overhand. And it's just uncomfortable for me tying this material in. This one's coming out pretty good. And with this spandex stuff, I like to go behind it and also in front of it when I'm tying it off. So that what I'm doing is, is I'm putting thread wraps on both sides of this to pinch it. Anything that compresses, I like doing that a lot. So it, it, it just seems to help the fly. And it uh, makes for a sturdier fly in my view. Stretch it, trim that off. Now I can finish off the fly with half inches in the front. Trim my thread. Now this, this handle part here, I like leaving the handle on, okay? And sometimes you can get, you can get lucky. What you do is you, if you want that length of a, of a tail, what you do is you take it out here and you stretch it, and if you give it a cut, it will split the tail, that spandex. And you wouldn't believe the extra action that that gives a little tail, okay? So I like that, just for the action. If the fish don't like it, if they start following this fly and they turn away, cut the tail off. And the, the fish will be on this thing because they really like this, the shape, they, they like the, uh, the shagginess of it. The tail is, is optional, okay? Thank you very much.